At this hour, we're taking a look at uh, County Commission District C, for which there are three candidates. Larry Brown is the incumbent. Uh, Gary Hosea is here, and no third candidate yet. So we will hold off on his announcement until he arrives. I'd like to remind uh, our moderators that we'd like you to introduce yourself at the beginning of your question. You're asking an active role from the federal level in taking those that have been identified violating the law in Clark County and immediately not releasing them back into our community, putting them into the federal system and having them deal with it. We do not have, at the local level, both financially and from a resource standpoint, we at Metro and the county do not have the ability to take that violation and criminal all the way through the system. It would, it would be impossible. So fix the, the missing link, which is transitioning from the local to the federal level. Will Crespo, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, the same one I asked the uh, county commissioner. Uh, what kind of incentives are you putting forward uh, to get more veterans to apply for public employment uh, with your city or with your county? And also, um, what are you doing to ensure that the county's public employees uh, mirror uh, the racial, I guess, the racial lines or the demographics of your community? Or the district that you're uh, representing? I think we, as far as the, the first part, the incentives for veterans and, and hiring and finding jobs, we have uh, in our human resource department a, an incentive simply that hiring a veteran puts someone on a priority list. Now they certainly still have to meet all the minimums and things like that, but all things equal, a veteran will have a priority hiring status coming into the system. And further, when we take it out of the public system and into the private sector, we have worked extremely well and closely with a lot of our trades in, in Southern Nevada, our labor groups, and we have encouraged them not only to hire veterans, and, they, and they're very aggressive in that area also, but in all our public works, especially right now our big transportation initiative, the fuel revenue, uh, we have an emphasis and even a priority on local hiring. And that has, uh, there's never been as much of a push on the local level as this campaign that's going on now. And the results have been outstanding. Not only hiring local labor, but hiring veterans, hiring minority-owned uh, business workers. So that, uh, it, it starts at the top, because although there are some federal laws and state laws as far as mandatory hiring, there are certainly ways you can, from a policy standpoint, emphasize, very strongly emphasize, that this is our priority hiring. Mr. Sure. Jose, anything to add? Uh, no, the one thing I would add is the county can be more uh, helpful in maybe having classes to translate <coughs> your military language into the actual job description. Right now, there isn't a push. When you get out of the military, you have a certain level of language or semantics to transfer into what the county is wanting as far as your job. Your job generally in the military is probably more than the county, but you don't know how to express it. So there should have classes or something like that for the military work. And some organizations, like Catholic Veterans, do does have that in the, in the city and county, but it's not very well known. Okay, Len Connell. Len Connell, this question is for both of you. Uh, estimates, and don't get me specific on this, but I believe that the average public sector employee in Nevada makes a third again as much as the average private sector employee, and that's despite the fact that we've been in years of work of a recession. We have police and firemen and other public officials that are using competitive compensation schemes, similar to the ones that were used on Wall Street and corporate America to draw billion dollar paychecks from the government. 
at the time than taxpayers or tax debt and having all kinds of problems. So my question is, what can you do and what do you plan to do to bring compensation back to a fair level and to prevent these abuses from happening within the Nevada public payroll system? Speak into the microphone, please. I was just asking, are we going to rotate responding okay. first? The, uh, the, the, first of all, the premise, uh, there's no question that the public employees in our state are some of the highest paid public employees nationwide. On the flip side of that point, and this is something that is often left off of, out of the discussion, uh, our public employees, from a ratio standpoint, are some of the lowest ratios per per capita in the country. So there's a little bit of a balance there. And that goes back 30 years when they were recruiting people to work in the desert. I think the most important thing as far as the public employee's salary is trying to get rid of some of the antiquated benefits. For example, uh, longevity. Uh, we have been on a six year negotiation with just about all our labor unions to get rid of longevity, which 30 years ago, 40 years ago was an incentive, now is just an extra paycheck. And that has been successful within all but one of the unions. And it, it works well because it's not, it's not taking away from any existing employee, it's creating a future system without longevity, which in the example of police and fire, over the 30 year window of the normal hire would save the county alone upwards of 30 to $35 million. And that's just those two groups. So you go in and you take a look at the elements of negotiation over the past 15, 20 years and identify those that are really antiquated, that should be taken out of the system, and try to get rid of this, well, people at the LBCBA get paid this, so the county should pay them that, the city pays them that, Henderson pays them that. That has been uh, a thorn in the side of fairness and equity because the Arbitration and the courts have said, well, if you're paying that same employee in Henderson, why shouldn't you pay it in the county? And it's just, it's not a fair comparison. You have to, uh, the revenue streams are differently. So that's another thing that we have to look at as far as what do we really compare it to? The value of the job or what someone's making in another municipality? I think one of the things that was brought up and Chairman Sislak, is we need to look at the tax structure and where the money is going and hire the best employees. And one thing that happened recently was Mayor Goodman and Mayor Lee had talked about maybe consolidation of governments. That's one thing that we need to do as a county is look at, seriously look at rather than talk about it consolidating government so that the taxpayer gets the most bang for the buck. Whether employees pay a little bit higher, yes, they've recently gotten rid of uh, the overtime pay for some people, and they've also uh, lessened overtime pay for people, but they've also cut out the longevity pay. And I think longevity pay should have been cut out for the average employee. Because all it's doing is increasing more money that the county has to pay out and also taxes. We need to look at ways to save money and help government be more efficient, run more efficiently, rather than the way it is now. We also have supervisors that don't really, once you get in the county, you're in the county. You can do, once you get your name in the county, you're supposed to do long, uh, a certain amount of time in your job and you're supposed to get a counseling statement telling you how you're doing your job. That isn't happening and we need to reinforce through our supervisors and M-Plan employees and reorganize. We need to look at reorganization of county government from a county manager who's wasted millions and millions of dollars all the way down to the bottom line employee. And we need to ask the lowest employees how to improve government from the bottom up. And then we'll be able to save money. 
I would like to remind the candidates to keep your responses within 60 seconds and the panelists to keep your question within 30. Mr. Luke. I'm sorry, Bob, but I haven't been able to say hello in 30 seconds in many years now. I will make the effort. Thank you. Robert Luke, uh, this is for both of you. I'm a 42-year resident of Clark County, and there's one thing I've noticed that whenever somebody's working on a road project or a highway project, I, I think you folks also give them like a six-month supply of Valium because they seem to take forever <laughs> to do these jobs. Uh, we see cones up and streets blocked off, lanes blocked off, and nobody's working, or you got six guys working, and then they might come back in a week or two or something. But you know, what can you do to make sure these projects get more efficient? There's a lot of businesses that have been hurt by being uh, uh, their customers have been kept away from their places. Gary Hosea, one thing I would do would be have an office of metrics and look at how long jobs are supposed to take and how long they're actually taking because it has been hurting local businesses. Down on Decatur, on Augusta, different streets, there, there's a lot of, Rampart was another example. Rampart Boulevard, all the way from Suncoast to uh, Cheyenne. There's a lot of traffic, a lot of congestion. Phones would be up one day or they'd just be sitting up. And the, the person putting them up didn't want to take them down, they just leave them up. That needs to be addressed and looked at so that we have better roads and better transportation. No question, recently, those uh, orange cones have been uh, as prolific as we've seen in the past 42 years you've been here. And that's partly because of the recession. During that four-year window, there was literally nothing done uh, as far as infrastructure investment. So we had a four-year gap. Coming out of the recession, uh, from the transportation side, we had the fuel revenue indexing, which is generating over 200 projects. So you had nothing, and we're accelerating now, and that's why you see so much activity. Now, certainly, it's not only roads. It's sewer, it's water, it's flood control, it's Southwest gas, it's net energy, all this coming together. To your point, we have to do a better job to collaborate. And there's a coordination committee that's been in existence for 30 years that over the last six months has been brought together <coughs> and re-energized with technology and GPS mapping and everything. We have to be able to do a better job on collaborating and coordinating. The secret also is on the front end of these contracts, as Gary mentioned, the scope of the work has to be clearly defined. If it's night work, then take the cones back, free up a lane. So the scope of the work of contracts has to be improved and the collaboration has to be improved. But understand that infrastructure investment, we're playing catch up and behind every cone is a lot of employment being generated out there and there are thousands of new jobs. Little patience, take that frustration, get it to the Sea Orange campaign and we'll get your stands. My mom always said that we just don't have any place to store all the orange cones. <laughs> I'm hopeful that with this new NFL stadium. Or if your mom has identified a street that isn't torn up, let us know. <laughs> Tell us Napper. Hello, my name is Tell us Napper, and I'm a DJ and radio talk show host for Music Medication. Uh, I've been here for about five years, and uh, it just seems like I've seen more cones here than, you know, just, it's just, I'm going to piggyback off this question, but my question is, um, why does it seem like um, the city and state are more, fo more focused on road improvement than education? And is your road improvement spending budget, budget more than your education spending budget? Well, we're focused on roads because what you see being done out there is county public works, city public works, RTC. That's, that's our role. We do not, uh, by statute, get involved on the education side as far as funding. That is primarily a state function. So the, you're mixing the two. Where NDOT is the state transportation, likewise, their budget is solely and restricted to the streets and highways. The education, uh, the education budget statewide is far greater than the infrastructure capital investment budget. 
by tens of millions, if not more. I don't have the numbers. So we don't we don't have the ability to take our transportation dollars, capital dollars, and build schools or fund higher uh, salaries for teachers. Just can't by statute. That's completely separate, and that's a state responsibility. Candidates, we need to close. We need to get you closer to the microphone when you speak. That'll be about an inch away. Mr. Jose. <laughs> One thing we don't have, as Larry had mentioned, Commissioner Brown mentioned, we don't have the resources to go into the education and do that. But as the county commission, most people don't realize is a part-time job. Unlike the city council of Las Vegas, where they've actually made it a full-time occupation, which it should be. But we can go into the classrooms and teach educational classes and, and be out there in the community, such as uh, Lawrence Weekly has done with various programs like he has done to try to increase the education and help the parent along and find better paying jobs so that people aren't working two, three, four jobs just to make ends meet in our local economy so that they can be home for their child so that they can nurture them to do well in school because education is key. I have three college degrees, so therefore I believe in education, but at the same time we need better roads and infrastructure such as in 2008 I had mentioned the monorail making it go all the way around 215 or having light rail because we need good roads and streets so we can get our people in here and get visitors in here and show them what Las Vegas is about. That way we can increase jobs, increase revenue, so it's not all being held by people that live in Las Vegas. Thank you. Mr. Patero? So uh, I'm Tim Patero. My question is for Mr. Jose. Looking at your website, I found something that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, on your website it says, and I quote, in all contracts with government, we need to promote Nevada's first policy. So given that, shouldn't it be, I understand the concept of keeping money locally and helping your own people, but well, should it be the lowest bidder? Because from my understanding, you're using tax dollars to fund these projects. So wouldn't your one priority be to save the taxpayer who's ultimately putting the bill for whatever service you're trying to well, enact? Well, that, if you look at my website, my website is a little bit outdated and being uh, updated as we speak. But at the same time, yes, we need to hire the lowest bidder, but it should be primarily from a Nevada corporation. Let's keep the jobs and the money in Nevada. And generally it has been Nevada, when we went out for low bids, it has been Nevada people. Recently there was one bid with uh, Las Vegas Paving going against Fisher. Fisher Corporation that was not the lowest bid and we ended up the county at the county uh, government paid Fisher umpteen thousand dollars for doing no work at all just so that they could give the job to Las Vegas paying. We need to look at that and determine who the lowest paying bidder is, but we need to hire an advantage for we need to keep the money here, and, and that way we keep our tax base better. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> statute reads low, responsive, and responsible bidder. So it's very rarely that uh, unless there's a technical error, mathematical, or something in the company's background that would rise to the level of disqualification, that's the way our state statute is set up. The emphasis, again, and it's an emphasis, on a county commissioner level or a city council level is to promote local companies hiring local workers. That has been very successful. And it's a fine line. Because we talked earlier about ethics. It's a fine line how far you can push a project to mandate local hiring. So right now we have a very comfortable work environment out there because we're seeing probably more local workers hired than ever before. But a word of caution, 
as we recover and as the infrastructure investment grows and as the economy grows, you watch those out-of-state license plates come back to town. And there's very little we can do legally to stop them, other than to make sure the trades get all our workers trained, that we have the appropriate workforce, because if it's here, we can do it and save money. But if we can't supply the workers that are needed, that's when the out-of-state license plates start showing up. Thank you. Hello, Daphne Lee here. Uh, my question is for Commissioner Brown. I read a, recently a couple of interesting headlines that said that the Las Vegas Municipal Court collected over $130 million, which is roughly 89% of its revenue, from traffic violations over the last five years. And the Nevada Supreme Court, I guess, is also decrying that they are impending financial crisis because they too rely on essentially traffic tickets as a source of revenue. Um, coupling that with Lombardo's recent statement because uh, violent crime here in Las Vegas has gone up 22%, which we all know is very interesting to see all these um, home invasions and homicide rates and everything go up. He said that it was because Prop 7, 47 in California, due to overcrowding in prisons, has released a bunch of non-violent, low drug offenders. That's the reason he gave as to why. Um, Okay, sorry, that's a lot of information. My point is, how do we ensure that Metro, with the resources that they have, are not inadvertently directed towards revenue um, generating for the courts and the government function, and instead are able to allocate their resources properly in order to protect us the, the, and serve the community? Because it seems like that's a really, probably a tough thing to balance. How do you as a commissioner kind of make sure that's going on and they're focusing on the proper thing that they need to be focusing on? Well, and just to clarify, you, you talked about the municipal courts yeah. and the, their uh, traffic czar and some of the things to do in the city of Las Vegas. We don't have anything to do with that. But I think specifically to your question, right now, and, and it, it doesn't take uh, rocket scientists, to figure out, if you look back in 07, 08, when our crime rate was the lowest that it had been in decades, and our officer per thousand number was over two, it was 2.04. Through the recession, we are down now to 1.73, 1.74. And if you look at the graph, it's just flipped. Crime is higher than it's been in 15 years. It's the presence of officers on the street. It's the ability to put officers into the neighborhoods on the community officer programs. We need to have visibility not, not only on the strip in downtown to protect tourists, but through every neighborhood in the county city areas. And it's the resources, it's not, Metro doesn't cite tickets to generate revenue for their, their budget. That, that's a fallacy. There's probably some connection there, but we need to find a sustainable funding source to not only hire more offices today, but over the next decade or 20, 20 years or longer. Because if we don't hire a, an officer, and I'll be quick, Bob, it, you, you don't turn on the switch and raise it up back to two, two officers per thousand. It takes close to 16 to 18 months before you get an academy recruit independent officer on the street. And as the attrition each year, so we're playing catch up with filling existing positions and trying to build the police force back up to where it was pre-recession. And that takes a sustainable funding source, which will be back in Carson City in 17, trying to find a way, competing against education and everything else. Thank you. Mr. Rosette. I, too, believe that we need to fund more officers, but at the same time, we need to create, as Chairman Sislak said, and in my new website that I'm putting out, will say that we need to have officers respond to like accidents versus crime. We need to have our sworn officers go to the crimes and have unsworn officers maybe help out the accident scenes and stuff like that. We need to balance a little bit more and increase our police force and uh, first responders and look at our resources better. The county has been wasting millions and millions of dollars 
at, at UMC. I know everybody loves UMC, and I like it too, but for the last eight years, we've been pumping in $80 million average each year to UMC. My idea eight years ago was to make it a VA hospital to improve our veterans' care at the same time, still have care for the county, and that way we would have federal dollars coming in to help alleviate some of that cost of that $80 million that's coming out of taxpayer so that we could have more cops on the street. We have to think outside the box. Thank you. Mr. Faust? My name is Robert Faust. I have a big voice, I guess. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Brown for his long, distinguished career on the uh, county commission. He's done a fine job. My question is, what are we going to do about cash and fuel? Okay, we've got to bring up the ethics question earlier. Uh, I work for the baseball team. I have for 15 years because despite what some people may feel, uh, I've always had a second job. So I have to be careful in responding. Because as a county commissioner, I'm not allowed to talk to those kind of people over here at the elected level. Here's the situation. There's a potential for a win-win-win. The city, if, and the baseball team wants to relocate because Cashman is, is old, 33 years. The city would receive 55 acres of prime real estate and for them to do whatever they wish to do with it. From the county. From the convention authority, which currently owns and operates. The convention authority wants out because they lose about five and a half million dollars a year keeping the doors open in Cashman. Their focus is on their $1.5 billion expansion of the convention center over the next decade. So they want out, and the ball team wants out. So we're looking for a new location where we can get out, get the city to land, get the authority out of that $5.5 million, and hopefully find a scenario that a new stadium could be built. A couple locations. I think I'm okay there, Mr. Beers. I was not addressing my answer to you. If you're well, not, if you're not, I will open against you. Well, Mr. Yeah. Okay, please. I'll navigate it, Mr. Brown. Gary? Uh, I think we need a new stadium. I'm not sure of the location. Uh, the people would have to decide that as would economics of the situation. Uh, Cashman is antiquity. We need something for a uh, major sports stadium. Uh, Venetian has proposed a stadium on the uh, campus of UNLV. Maybe that could be baseball and softball like San Diego is. Who knows? Right now, we need something to improve Cashman Field. So what happens to Cashman Field after the stars of the 51's move? What it, uh, with the city's long-range planning for downtown, uh, Mr. Beers could probably answer this better, but to, to be in receivership of, other than demolishing the existing facility, being in receivership of 55 acres, a uh, quarter mile from the downtown Fremont core, uh, <coughs> not too many cities can boast that. Uh, now, as far as the vision, what should go there, that's going to be left up to the leadership of the city and the private sector. But you don't find 55 acres that close to a downtown core in too many cities around the country. And you're talking about the, the property that the stadium sits on now? Yes. Plus, we have a little land at Symphony Park we can sell you, too. <laughs> uh, thank you. Ms. Lake? Hello, Commissioner Cindy Lake and Mr. Hosea. Thanks for taking time today. I had a couple of questions. I'll make them brief. Actually, I did see you there at the uh, game last week, the Mets versus Cubs, and I was going to ask you, were you supporting the Mets or the Cubs? <laughs> First and foremost. Um, secondly, I ran for county commission in 2014, and one of the platforms, one of my platforms was, uh, one of my pet peeves is the um, Republic Services reducing pickup to one time per week, and my bill is, is the same as it was when, when my pickup, my trash pickup was twice a week. Did you vote for that change to the contract, Commissioner Brown? I'm not sure. And, um, and one more thing, a suggestion was to consider um, reducing public salaries to $100,000 per year and take that money and hire more cops. So would you consider doing that? 
Thank you. Let me take the first one on, and I think we're talking about the um, the recycling program that we've, we've adopted. It's it's not throughout the county, but it's going to be over the next few years. I did support it, and I supported it for a couple reasons. One is uh, the pilot programs that were done in parts of unincorporated county in the city of Las Vegas. The uh, numbers were coming back, surveys of the users were coming back at a 90% acceptance rate. The push to recycle, and there's a whole another debate whether that's the right thing to be doing. But we're not we're not eliminating the number of stops through public services we're making in the county. We're just changing the mix from two times a week garbage to one time a week garbage, one time a week recycling. But they'll still have currently you have like we don't have the recycling program yet. Currently we have ten stops from Republic. Those ten stops per month are not going to change. It's the dynamic of what they're picking up is going to. Now, the bigger question, which one of my colleagues brought up, is, well, wait a second, they're, they're making millions of dollars. They should be cut, cutting our monthly rate. Well, our, our monthly service charge with Republic is one of the lowest in the entire Southwest, if not the nation. So we're, we are getting outstanding service. And we'll find out 5, 10, 15 years whether this push to recycle has been the appropriate move, but I support it because the customers were enjoying it, the service levels were staying. Some of the people only have one car garage, and it's very hard to find space to put the recyclable trash can that they want you to have and the non-recyclable trash can in your uh, garage out of view because the CCR say you have to have your trash cans out of view except for on trash day. So something in the law, the state law, has to change to alleviate that problem. Thank you. Real quick, um, Mr. Pinsett, uh, did Republic Services donate to your campaign and has Republic Services donated to yours? Yes. Okay. No. Thank you. Mr. Lafada. Hi there, I'm Scott Lafada and I'm with uh, Conservatives for Energy and Freedom and the State Director. I'm going to address two different questions. Larry, I'm going to ask you this question first because it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, today, we drive on these surface streets in the county uh, that are outside the Las Vegas area, uh, for instance, Fort Apache, and the speed limit is 45 miles an hour. But did you know uh, there's many people driving between 40, 60, and 65 miles an hour? Would you support a lower speed limit uh, with the county commission that obtained lower speed on those surface streets to help save lives? Uh, I, I would, and right now there's a uh, dialogue going on between the RTC and NDOT and our member agencies on arterials now that's a Ford Apache. Traditionally, we build our arterials four to six lanes of travel, throw up 45 miles an hour, and get cars from point A to point B as quickly as possible. We're studying now the, redu the reduction of speeds from 45 to 35 on the arterials, and future arterials are being designed to a complete street standard, which reduces six to four, builds better pedestrian safety areas. Now I say that dialogue is going on because the, the statistics have not been brought forward, but we are looking specifically at that issue from 45 down to 35. And it, as far as just timing, you lose, I, I think you lose a matter of six or seven seconds every mile. Or it's some ridiculously low number that you're losing as far as time. But it's, it's one of those things that we've always done it that way, and we have to <coughs> change the way we look at this. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I've got a different question for you. Uh, and this comes from the uh, students in the, uh, at CSN. And they want to be asked, what is your plan to lessen the amount of homeless veterans in the county? One of my first plans would be something that uh, our county commission has not addressed. Is if you go to the Clark County website and there, you look at departments, there is a homeless department there with no phone number. That is unacceptable. And that's a, one of the first things I would change. I would look at having an office of metrics to enhance 
contracts and stuff like that and move some people around rather than lay them off to have mission has really not done anything to improve the county government. Right now, as a county employee, there is no incentive program. There is no pat on the back periodically. Your supervisors, uh, they hire people and put people in positions and there's no recourse. We need people, we need accountability. That's what we need. And I'm accountable and will be accountable to the people. If I say I'm gonna do the job full time, I'm gonna do the job full time. Okay. Okay then. I think this is dying, so I'm just Mr. Beers, if I may, just uh, just to clarify for the record, since this is being taped, uh, when I ran in one city council, I made the same statement that I would make this a full-time job, which all you have to do is check the records. It was a full-time job. At the county, although Mr. Jose says it's a part-time job, you can call it whatever you want, but I would uh, venture to say that most weeks I am working either at the government center or on county commission, CBA and the room tax. They certainly take in a, a, a good percentage of those room tax, but it goes to school district, it goes to parks, it goes to all different things. When we, at Metro, when we have a forfeiture fund that Metro seizes it, that money I've, I've always felt should go back into Metro and hire more cops. A lot of that goes to the school district and spread out. So you have all these revenue stream, streams being uh, diminished and diluted by sending to other public agencies that there's no real nexus. If we could focus on that key issue as far as who's generating the revenue and how the revenue is being spent, if we could bring some clarity and some more common sense to that whole aspect, I think that's a chewable bite to your bigger question, can we scrap it all? Thank you, Mr. Brown and Sir Jose. I think that as Commissioner Brown stated, that we need to look at the revenue streams as far as state government goes, and, and also help, it would help out local government. But at the same time, we need to look at, in the community, with other municipalities, possibly consolidation of services to assist the taxpayer and stop overspending such as communications department in Clark County itself. Why not have a communications department, one communications department for all of Clark County so that Clark County doesn't speak out of six sides of its mouth. Every little department, family services, has their own communications person, RTC has theirs, Public Works has theirs. We need to consolidate and reduce, yes, reduce jobs, and reduce spending and look at better ways of managing uh, our money. Thank you. One final question will come from our guest questioner who is in the ninth grade, so go easy on him, candidates. <laughs> no, actually, I'm kidding. He's not going to go easy on you. I've heard him question before. So. Hello, my name is David Suazo, and I am a homeschooler in the ninth grade. And I would like to ask, I'm pretty sure you guys know already that our school system is almost 50th in the country. And the more and more we spend, it seems like it keeps on getting worse. So I would like to ask, what are you going to do to d reduce spending in the Clark County School District? David, that, it's a tough one because we don't we at the county commission don't control that budget that is uh, approved at the state and goes directly to the Clark County School District Board of Trustees. It's it's almost entirely independent from our revenue and our, our budget. So, and I don't want to avoid the question, but we can't. We can't go in and tell the school district or the state how to spend those school district dollars. Okay, sir. If you one thing I would look at is not reducing the school budget, but looking at ways that we fund schools now within 
when we have a developer come in, how much land or what are they paying for as putting new schools in there and how long of time before that school is going to be antiquated and the services it is that is. Also, as a commissioner, it is a part-time job. It's labeled a part-time job. A commissioner could be in there teaching an education class sometimes, periodically getting involved. Another thing is using the media, which is this as part of veterans and politics as part of, is showing the waste and stuff, just in, as in there's waste and fraud in the county commission, there's waste and fraud in our school system. When I see a person driving from a club at one o'clock in the morning and it's a county or a city vehicle or a, even a Clark County education vehicle at one o'clock in the morning, how's that person driving the vehicle at one o'clock in the morning? He's coming from a entertainment club or something like that. Thank you, Mr. Hosea, for your answer. All right, so with that, we will conclude this interview panelists. Thank you very much, candidates. Thank you very much. We're going to take a